Hey, welcome to our YouTube. We're about to listen to a message from our church here in Hillsong, Denmark. Make sure to comment below, like, subscribe, or even share with a friend, and stick around afterwards for different ways to connect. But as you know, uh, oh, big shout out to Aarhus. Can everyone in Copenhagen just give a massive cheer and clap to everyone in Aarhus? We love you guys. Uh, we have church over in Aarhus. They meet at 11 o'clock as well. Ibungan. Uh, because everything in Jutland ends with an on. And so they're meeting in Bungan and um, having a great time over there and looking forward to being there very soon. But um, as, um, as you heard before, we have just come back from a longer trip with the family. And um, if you've ever traveled with your whole family for a longer time, uh, you will appreciate one thing when you get home, and, and that's space. Can I get an amen? Uh, you know, you love your family, uh, and you love people that are near to you, but sometimes you just need space, you know, uh, and not to live in each other's pockets. You know, we didn't have to ask a single time the last five weeks, where is so-and-so, because everyone is right here all the time, uh, which is amazing. It's a little bit like when you move from an apartment into a house. Uh, a few years ago, we moved from an apartment into a house, and in our apartment, all of the rooms, they faced the living room. And so there was one seat, actually there was one seat at the dinner table where you could sit, and if you swirled around, you could see every room, uh, which is a great, the only room you couldn't see was the bathroom, also known as the escape room, uh, or the safe room, uh, but every, everything else. But when you suddenly moved into a, a house, um, you had space, and now when you got home, you didn't know immediately if other people were home. And you had to look for clues. You had to look for clues if people were home. It could be shoes in the doorway. It could be a school bag that's just been thrown carelessly uh, in the hallway. It could be a fridge. Uh, we have teenagers. It could be a fridge that's open, not shut. Uh, it could be the lights have been turned on. The door's probably open and not shut. You know, there's, there's clues that you are looking for. And I want to I wanna speak a message today uh, that I've just called, hello? Hello? Let's pray together. Jesus, we just thank you for, um, for this opportunity to be together. And, uh, and I just pray we'll not take it for granted that we can come together in church. And whether people are sitting here in Copenhagen and all who's or watching online later, Lord God, I just pray, Jesus, for... You just speak through me like I believe you've spoken to me, Lord God. Take this message, break it into hundreds of pieces, and let people hear what they need to hear. And Lord, we just pray that by the end of this, that we'll be more in love with you than when we came in. We thank you for this opportunity. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I don't know if you've ever told someone that you believe in God, that you maybe are a Christian. Uh, I don't know about the responses you get, but often the responses I get would be something like, I cannot believe that you believe in a God. I cannot believe that you are a Christian. That is so old-fashioned. You know, that is so irrelevant. I remember a few, probably a year ago now, I was stuck in a queue. We were, I was with a friend, and we were about to cross over Storbergsborn, and someone wanted to jump off the bridge. So we were stuck. Everything got shut down. And I just tweeted out or X'd out um, a message saying, praying for whoever is about, you know, to jump or whatever's going on. And the comments back were so positive, <laughs> you know. It's like, you are, you know, that's irrelevant and you believe in fairy tale. And, you know, I cannot believe that you believe in something that science cannot prove. I mean, the truth is, most of us, believe in something that science cannot prove. When, when we were away, there was a big event that took place uh, on January 14th here in Copenhagen. Does anyone remember what that was? A coronation. Yeah, we, we apparently got a new king uh, and queen. Uh, I say apparently because my question is, prove it. How, how can you prove it? I mean, you can show me some pictures, you can show me some videos, and maybe you can give me some historical truth, but you can't give me scientific truth. Because scientific truth, by definition, means that you've got to be able to repeat what it is that you're trying to prove. 
So really, all you can do is give me enough clues that gives me more faith than I have doubt that what you're saying is true, which is really what faith is. I know in my life, you know, people will often come to me and go, do you ever have doubt? I'm like, do I ever have doubt? Uh, Yeah, all the time. I do have doubt, but my, my job as a Christian is not to not have doubt. My job as a Christian is to make sure I have more faith than I have doubt, that, it, that I'm leaning towards faith. There will always be doubt because God is that big. If I had no doubt, there would be no faith. The doubt proves my faith. But my job as a Christian is to have more faith than I have doubt. It is to look at the clues. When I get home in the house, I look at the clues, and even though I cannot see anyone, even though I can't hear anyone, I look at the clues and I go, okay, I have more certainty than not than someone is at home right now. Life is very much like that as well. We are surrounded by all of these things. We call them metaphysical things. Metaphysical, metaphysical things are things that you cannot prove with science. Metaphysical things are things that are not bound by natural laws, things that all of us, we believe in, but science cannot prove. It's things that are transcending natural laws. For example, like how music moves us. Why does music move us? How come we listen to music when, have you ever watched a scary movie? I don't like scary movies. I like, I just, I hate scary movies, whatever. If you like scary movies, you're weird. And sorry, I know who you are. But I just don't like scary movies. But I do know if there is a scary scene, all I gotta do is turn the volume down. Why? Because it's the music that scares you. It's like, do, 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 you know, it's the music. It's like you watch a movie and it's like, you know, the end of Toy Story 3 and they're all like about to get burned and then the music, it moves you. You're sitting on the plane with your kids crying. (laughs) Don't die. You know, because why does music move us? What about beauty? What is that? Like scientifically, what is beauty? Why do we make it? Like what is it about, why did cavemen 10,000, 100,000 years ago, why would they take time to draw? What is that? What about love? Like, can you prove that you love someone? Well, I can, you can give me examples of, you know, things you've done that, that, that show that you love someone, but can you, can you scientifically prove it? No, you, you really, you can't. Because these are things that we believe in that really science cannot Prove they're metaphysical experiences that are part of our reality. What about the moral law that all of us have within us? Morality, the one that causes our conscience to tell us whether something is right or wrong. What about conscience? Some video here, conscience. What is that? What, what, why do we have that? And more importantly, who placed it there? Now, you might say, oh, evolution taught us that. No, nah, no, nah, not really. And you say, yeah, but that's herd mentality because it is good not to kill someone if you want to protect the herd. It's good not to steal something or rape someone. That, that, that's, it's good because it protects the herd. Yeah, but the challenge with the human moral code is that humans have the capacity to love their enemies. Why is that? If it was just a herd mentality, we should let the person drown. We should let the person go away. We should let the person leave if it didn't protect the herd. There is something within us. Now, I actually believe that science and faith are not too far apart. As the Pulitzer Prize winning author Annie Dillard wrote in her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, she said, what is the difference between a cathedral and a physics lab? Are they not both saying, hello? Truth is, there's more between heaven and earth. There is more within us than just skin and bones. There is truly something unusual going on here. And my question is, really, are all these metaphysical clues, are they clues or are they actually fingerprints? C.S. Lewis, he said it like this, if there was a controlling power outside of the universe, it couldn't show itself to us like one of the facts inside the universe. 
No more than an architect of a house could actually be a wall or be the staircase or be the fireplace in that house. No, the only way in which we would expect it to show itself would be inside of ourselves as an influence or a command trying to get us to behave in a certain way. And that is just what we find in ourselves. Surely this ought to arouse our suspicions. In the 16th century, the Catholic Church persecuted anyone that had what was called a heliocentric worldview. And it basically just meant that the, the scientist says, hey, wait a minute, Earth is not the center. The sun is the center. And people like, got, you know, got so angry. They're like, I can't believe you're saying that. Because people didn't like the idea that humans weren't the center of the universe. Well, that's exactly what we find when we discover God. We suddenly discover, which I think is one of the biggest reasons that people push against religion, is one of the biggest reasons that people push against Christianity, is because suddenly you realize you are not the center of the world. God is. As we have a book out in the, in the resource center called Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and the first sentence of that book says, it's not about you. <laughs> Life is not about you. There is something else at play here. And the quest for all of us in order to find our fulfillment, in order to find our purpose here on earth, it is to figure out why has God created us? Why has God made us? The Bible says in Ephesians 2.19, he says, it's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. With as much right to the name Christian as anyone, God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what he's building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation, and now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. Like I said earlier, we, um, we start every year at Hillsong Church with uh, seven chapters. Just seven chapters that are kind of taking us on a journey where we grow together. Uh, our goal as a church here at Hillsong is not just for people to show up, but it's for all of us to grow up. <laughs> uh, it is to discover what we're made for. And this year, um, instead of having just seven individual chapters, the seven chapters actually form a sentence. And the sentence is this. We are a contemporary, Christian, charismatic, conservative church community. That is the sentence for the year. And so really, when we get to the end of the year, this is what I hope all of us can remember. And now you can miss you know, mix them around how you want, as long as all of those elements are there. We are a contemporary, Christian, charismatic, conservative church community. And since we're at the end of chapter one today, we're starting chapter two next Sunday, I wanted just to kind of lay out the foundation of what it is that these are about. We are, is about who we are as a church. And I'll get in on that in just in a moment. And so if you're wondering what kind of church this is, you have come to the perfect Sunday because we're about to go through that. Is that okay? Contemporary is about our mission and our moment in history. Christian is about Easter. Easter is what makes us Christian. Charismatic is about experiencing God through his Holy Spirit. Conservative is about preserving the ancient theology and traditions of the Bible in a changing world. Church is about building what Jesus is building. And lastly, community is about Christ-centered communi communities and fellowship with one another. Is that okay? And so let's just read. Um, I'm gonna read just the memory verse one more time for today, and I'm gonna finish off the paragraph, and then we're gonna grab a few points from that. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, Acts chapter two, verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Remember, this is the first description we have of church in Acts. This is, you know, Jesus has just 
died, he's risen from the dead. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And then he disappeared. <laughs> it was awesome. And, and then the church gathered. 3,000 people found Christ and they gathered together. And it says, everyone was filled with awe, the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They even sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When God created the earth, he created it, and the Bible says the earth was empty and it was in chaos. And out of that emptiness, out of that void and chaos, God created the cosmos. He created everything with precision. Later, he spoke to the Israelites in the wilderness, and he, cre he asked them to create the temple, the tabernacle. Again, out of the wilderness, out of the void, out of the chaos, something was to be built. A microcosmos was to be built with precision. Today, in the New Testament, we are building his church. Again, out of the void, out of the wilderness, out of the chaos, we are seeking to build something, to create something that can be a refuge for people around us. Jesus prayed in his famous prayer in Matthew 6. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we read a prayer like this, we've got to ask ourselves, where does the metaphysical end and the spiritual begin? Where does the natural end and the spiritual begin? Where, where does the natural end and the supernatural begin? We live in a world that is supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. You know, all the way throughout history, God, he cre asks us to create something and then he blesses it and his spirit fills it. And you've got to ask yourself, when we are building church, what is it that we've invited you to? Is this just an event? Is this just a gathering of natural people? Or is this really a framework that is creating space for something bigger than ourselves? I know I'm laying, laying a big foundation just to deliver a few points. <laughs> uh, but I want you to catch this. Because sometimes I think we can think of church, especially in Denmark, where church is really an institution. Church is something that we go to that's physical. We've got to understand it is physical, yes, but it's also very spiritual. It's very spiritual, but it's also very physical. Those two things are not either or, it is both and. The rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, he said it like this, our potential greatness is that we can create structures, relationships, and lives that become home for the divine presence. Just, just look at that. Our potential greatness, you and I, our potential greatness is that we can create structures, relationships, and lives that become home for the divine presence. You can create natural structures. What is a marriage? What is a friendship? What is a company, even, founded upon godly principles? What is an organization founded on godly principles, if not a natural structure that can become home for the divine presence? Your marriage is not just supposed to be a natural solution that makes sense financially. <laughs> that makes sense, yep, that's, I guess this is a good way to raise the kids. No, it's a natural structure that can become a home for God's divine presence. Your, your friendships is not just a, oh, I guess we like the same things. No, there is actually, you can add a purpose to it where it suddenly becomes home for a divine presence. It is supposed to be a microcosmos, heaven on earth. Church is supposed to be a heaven on earth, where heaven and earth meets. It is supposed to be an escape from, and it's supposed to be an example to. A heaven on earth. One translation of Acts 2, verse 47, says people in general like what they saw. People in general like what they saw. They looked through the window. I don't have a window, so I'll use this. They looked through the window of church, and they go, I like what I'm seeing. You know, they looked through the window of church, into church community. They looked through the windows of a connect group. They looked through the window of a godly marriage. 
They look through the window of a life of someone that says that they were a follower of Jesus. And the Bible says, in general, they liked what they saw. So what did they see? And more importantly, what do they see? When they look at our church, when they look at your life, when they look at my life, what do people see? This chapter is called We Are. And it's a little bit of a throwback because when we first started church, I had one sentence that I used to say all the time, and that is, we are who we are. We are who we are. We are corporately who we are individually. So people would come to me and say, what's Hillsong like? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, is Hillsong a friendly church? I said, I don't know. Are you friendly? Because I guess if you're friendly and I'm friendly, then yeah, we are friendly. (laughs) Yeah, but is Hillsong like one of those churches that is really encouraging? I don't know. Are you encouraging? Are you encouraging? Am I encouraging? I guess if we're encouraging, then yeah, we're an encouraging church. Yeah, is, is Hillsong one of those like generous churches? I don't know. Are you generous? Am I generous? Because if we're generous, then yeah, we're one of those generous churches. You, you, and so you could go, what kind of marriage are we? What kind of family are we? What, what kind of company are we? Well, we are corporately who we are as individuals. The whole is made up of the individuals. Who we are comes down to who we are. So if you go, what kind of church do you want to be part of? What kind of church is this? Well, on the way out, go into the restroom, look in the mirror. That's Hillsong Church. And so really, it's it's an encouragement to all of us and a challenge for all of us to be the church that you want to see. Be the church you want to see. I go through the foyers and no one says hi. Do you say hi? You know, no one invites me out for lunch. Do you invite someone out for lunch? No one brings their friends. Do you, you know, like, we are who we are. We are corporately who we are as individuals. Be the church you want to see. I have a fish tank up here. There's obviously a reason for it. Um, You know, if, if our potential for greatness is that we can create natural structures that can become home for the divine presence. We've got to ask ourselves, what actually makes up these natural structures? And, and really, what makes it up, whether it's a marriage or whether it's a church or a company, I guess the first thing that makes up a structure is what we believe. What we believe, our theology, our belief system. Like, what we believe, because we will always grow to people's expectation of us, or we will lower ourselves. And so what we believe, if we just believe, well, our, our marriage is always, we always fight. That's what we believe about us. We, that's, that's, we, we fight. That's, that's who we are. Uh, we, we, um, we, don't, we don't dream big in this family. <laughs> that's my belief. That's, that, that becomes a belief system. But also your theology, what you believe becomes one of the sides of your structure. The second thing is, um, what else should we take here? Here, who we are. Who we are, that's our values. You know, our values as a family, our values as a friendship, our value is is basically a question of, well, well, who who, who are we? Like, what what are our values? And if you don't know them, How are you ever going to know if they're being threatened? What are your Amos? um, There's a book in the Bible called Amos. He's called a minor prophet, which is really sad. I mean, if you made the Bible, surely, I mean, seriously, that's that's just harsh. He's a minor prophet. He made the Bible, all right? It's it's amazing. But Amos, he says in chapter 3, verse 3, how can two people walk together unless they agree? The, The people that you have in your life, you agree on something. And it's a good idea to find out what that is. Because most often it's their values. It's who we are. And, you know, it's a good idea to figure out what your values are. So when values come into your family, maybe you start hanging out with some friends, and you're like, they don't sit right. Something feels off. Why is that? It could be because you don't have the same values. The other thing, the third thing that creates a structure is what we do. Our behavior is our culture. Culture is basically, if you want to define culture, culture is just what we do around here. You know, it's not always written down. It's just like, you know, we just spent five weeks in Australia, 
And quickly you find out, oh, this is just how we do things around here. You know, we were going to a party on one of the first days, a birthday party, one of our friend's daughter's uh, birthday party, and we were like freaking out because we were running late. Uh, now we were running very late, so that's not, that's not okay. But we were, in the beginning, we were just running a little bit of late. And, and we, were, we had to kind of remind our, ourselves, and they reminded us, you're not in Denmark. <laughs> You know, because in Denmark, you can set the clock. I mean, you've got the international atomic clock, or you can just take any social event that includes Danes, and you can set your clock after that. You know, it's like the party starts at 11, and you know at 11 on the dot, the doorbell will ring. It is just a cultural thing here in Denmark. We appreciate it. In Australia, it's a little bit more laid back, okay? It's like we have the word called ish. It starts at 11-ish. You know, you get there when you get there. You know, culture is just what we do around here. What's the culture in the structure that you're building? In your friendship, in your life, in your career, in your business, in your marriage, what are the culture of that structure? And lastly, it is why. Why do we exist? Why does this marriage exist? Why does this company exist? Why does this church exist? What is the purpose of it? What is the mission of it? And when we look at some of these blueprints of the early church, we see who they were corporately came out of what each of them devoted themselves to. So I want to just give you, and I'm going to take, I'm going to do super quick, I'm going to give you seven quick things, okay? Seven quick things that we see in this scripture in Acts chapter 2 of the early church. Seven things that are achievable by all and beneficial to all. Is that okay? Seven things that I believe and I hope that all of us can build into our lives, but also be part of building into our church. Number one, they devoted themselves to a connection with God and people. There was a connection with God and people. That's the number one thing. At the end of the day, it's about loving one another and it's about loving God. And you know, I pray that this church will be the kind of church where we're not holding your past up against you, but we're holding your God-given future up in front of you. And we're not trying to keep you to your past, but we can believe that there is a bigger and a better day ahead of you. Amen? There was a connection with God and people. Number two, there was a personal devotion, a personal devotion. Mature Christians have a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's gonna take time, I get it. But it is hopefully something we're gonna build towards, grow towards, that your only connection with God is not just on a Sunday. Because that's like you're hooked up to a life machine, a life support machine. But that all of us, we have our personal walk with Jesus. That's why we do connect groups, where we can encourage one another in our personal walk with Jesus, a personal devotion. Number three, servanthood. Servanthood. It was part of the early church, and I pray it's part of our church. And the servants, serving of one another is more than a social connection. It's about contributing to the betterment of others. It is that when I walk into a room, I am looking, how can I give and not just take? How can I add value and not just take value? It doesn't mean that you're not getting value. It doesn't mean that you yourself are not on the receiving end. But if our mentality is, when I come to church, when I step into an environment, when I step into a circle, if I'm looking to serve rather than being served, it changes the whole atmosphere. Because suddenly no one is missing out because all of us are thinking like that. So while you're serving someone else, they are also serving you. Isn't that what a marriage is? Isn't that what a friendship is? Some people can look at a marriage and go, it's about one submitting to the other. No, it's not. It's mutual submission. It's that I submit to you and you submit to me. I serve you, but you also serve me. But I'm not telling you to serve me. I'm serving you. And hopefully you have the same attitude that I'm serving you as well. Hopefully a marriage is one person looking for the gold in the other, and that person is looking for the gold in the other. And together we are both growing. Imagine walking into the foyer. Imagine walking into a connect group. Imagine walking in here, not just with a sense of serve me, feed me, 
do something for me, but having the eyes of, I wonder who I can encourage today. I wonder who I can just put a smile on their face today. I wonder what word I can say or what action I can do that puts a smile on someone else's face. So when they leave this place, they leave just happier and, and more encouraged than when they walked in. I think that deserves a clap or a nod or a smile or something. There is a sense of servanthood. Number four, responsibility and ownership. These people weren't just consumers. They took ownership of each other with their time, with their talent, and with their treasure. It says they sold their possessions to help each other. That's also why we we take time in our services to go, hey, if you can help out financially, hey, if you can honor God in this area as well, let let us help each other out. Let us build this place. Let us build this place so that more people can come in and have the same connection. Take responsibility and ownership. Maybe this year. Maybe that is one of the things that you want to step out in this year And when it comes to tithes and, and giving. Maybe it's this year where you just say, I've been listening to these tithing videos now for the last five weeks, and it makes sense. And I want to step out, and I want to, I want to grow in that area as well. Number five, personal social justice. Personal social justice. And personal social justice is basically just about, let's not outsource justice. Let's not outsource justice. What I mean by that is, I think it's so easy. Um, I was looking at the wrong time, by the way. I, I looked at the timer and go, oh, wow, I've got 12 minutes left. But that's been like that for a long time, and I realized that's the time. Um, Sorry, I want to say I'm jet lagged, but I'm not. It's just me. Um, social justice, you know, I don't know about you, but I find it it's so easy to make, make excuses why not to show kindness. Have you ever found that? Like, we harden our hearts, and we get good at it. I, 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 there was one particular moment I will never forget, and I don't have the exact details, but I remember the moment. I remember walking with my kids, um, at Stroyd, and we were walking through Stroyd, and someone was begging. Someone was asking for money. And as we were walking, uh, my daughter said, hey, could we give him something? And I said, no, they're just going to use it on drugs. You know? And like the moment I said that, it was like, I mean, God or my conscience or something. It's like, who do you think you are? Like, who do you, okay, you hardening your heart, but don't you dare teach the next generation to harden their heart. Like, how easily do we make excuses for not being moved? I don't know what they're going to do with it. It might be true, but that's none of my business. My business is to stay soft. My business is to use what's in my hand to do good. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is to raise the next generation with a heart that goes, yes, let's give. Let's give. And so it's like, I'm so sorry. Yes, let's give them something. Let's give them something. There was personal social justice. Number six, global social justice. You will hear this year in our church about partnerships we have around the world. 821, the fights human trafficking that Phil helps head up. Um, partnerships in India and in Mumbai, India and, and different partnerships and we, we do that because we believe that as a church we're not called to be on the sidelines we believe that we're not just called to be spectators to, to injustice but actually to be part of the answer and we've often said we can't do everything but we must do something and it's because we believe it's part of who we are is global social justice and the seventh and final thing is helping someone else become part of the kingdom It's part of who we are. It's not just to keep it for ourselves, but actually to look around and go, hey, who else can I help join this kingdom, to join church, to join, you know, to discover their own faith so they can discover God for themselves. And it says people liked what they saw. I think if there's one thing, church, that part of our calling is, it is to help change people's perception of Jesus and church just just help them just change the perception of what church is of who Jesus is you know an attractive spirituality is an authentic 
spirituality. And attractive spirituality, it's not that everything is perfect. You know, it's not that everything is, you know, everything is just, you know, always perfect. We, we, uh, I posted a few days ago some family pictures that we took in Australia. We don't really do family, you know, photo shoots. The last time we did it was 12 years ago. Um, so we, we just don't do it. But we, did, we decided to do a family photo shoot. And, you know, whenever you, you take photos that are especially professionally, you know, taken photos, it just looks like the perfect family. And as I'm looking through the pictures, you know, I was just thinking, I'm just so grateful that these pictures didn't record the audio. <laughs> I, I'm just, does anyone with me? Come on. I mean, that photo that you take with Santa Claus and, you know, and it's like somehow they managed Photoshop. They managed that one picture where you, you actually look like a happy family. I'm just so grateful um, that those pictures didn't have audio. Um, and, I, and I wrote... I wrote in the caption, someone once said, a family is a little world created by love. We far from a perfect family. We argue, we fight, we even stop talking to each other. But in the end, family is family. The love will always be there. Why? Because that is our natural structure that can house the supernatural. That family of ours, that's our little natural structure that we, that we are guarding, that we are protecting, that we are building, that we believe can house the supernatural. So what's yours? What's your natural structure that you're building? What's that natural structure that you're building, maybe together with someone else, maybe alone, but you're building this, this, this container, big or small, you're building this container that you're believing can house something supernatural. I was on a phone call with a friend just two days ago and I was in the middle of, of, of writing this message and I was like, bro, I just believe that what you're building, he's building a company at the moment. I'm, I'm like, bro, I just believe the company you're building is natural structure that's going to house something supernatural. It's going to be bigger than just make creating wealth. It's going to house something supernatural. And I'm praying that when you leave today, that you will leave with a passion for what's in your hand. Not comparing with someone else, not going... Oh, I only have this and they have that. You know, not, not, not going, it's just this, but I want that. And God's like, yeah, but I'm giving you this for now. Can you be faithful with this? Can you grow this? Let, let's, let's trust God with this and trust that it's going to make a home for His divine presence. These verses started with, they devoted themselves they devoted themselves. Someone once said that God doesn't have grandchildren. <laughs> and what it means is you cannot live on someone else's faith. You've got to get God for yourself. Even going to church, it doesn't make you a Christian. Just like standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. Because at the end of the day, Christianity is not about rules and regulations. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus. That's what it is. People go, oh, I could never be a Christian. Why? There's so many things you're not allowed to do. All these rules and regulations. Now that you're talking about religion. That's what religion is. But religion is trying to work something out that God never worked in. It's like when you try and, and look the part, but you're not it. You, you look like you, you got it together, but really, man, it's crumbling on the inside. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus. And, and I, love the, I love the picture that the Bible uses that what you call rules and regulations, the Bible actually calls fruit. Fruit. Which I love that because what it is, is that it's something that grows. And it grows naturally, organically. So that means that what I do, I focus on Jesus. How do I do that? Well, I read my Bible every day and I pray and I, I spend time with other believers. I, I come to church. I, I do things that Jesus followers do. <laughs> that, that, that's me sinking my roots in. And we're at different stages. All good, all good. No pressure. We all at different stages. But I slowly get my roots sunk into this relationship with Jesus. And slowly but surely, I don't know how, I don't know when, but slowly there is something that takes place. You can always say, almost say metaphysical, 
or spiritual that takes place in my life where I get changed and suddenly fruit starts growing. And people will say things like, oh, wow, you're not as angry as you, as you used to be. Oh, you're, you're not doing that anymore. Oh, is that because you're not allowed to? Oh, no, I'm not even focused on that. I'm focused on Jesus. But it, things are changing because my focus is not what I need to do. My focus is who I need to be. I'm in a relationship. The more I develop this relationship, the more this stuff takes care of itself. And I would love to pray for anyone here today that maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've been here for a while, but you've never opened your life up to the reality of God. Maybe you've done this stuff well, and I, you know, well done. I mean, you must be tired because <laughs> if you're just focusing on this, that's, whew, that's striving. That's like, whew, man, it's hard being a Christian. Yeah, of course it is if that's what you're focusing on. But Christianity is not that. Christianity is surrender. It's saying, God, I can't do this in my own strength, and I'd love your, I'd love your help, which is what grace is, is God's help. So could I get everyone just to close your eyes and maybe just bow your heads just to give everyone here a, a moment of privacy? Maybe you stood in a cathedral or a lab or under a star-filled sky and you said, hello? I believe that today God is looking back at you and He's saying, Hello. And he wants to start a relationship with you. He wants to start a friendship with you. And it's going to be slow and it's going to be awkward at times. And like any relationship, and you're going to get to know each other and you're going to say things and do things. And, you know, you, we're going to figure it out. Some of us have been on this journey for a while and others have just started and some are about to start. The cool thing is that you're surrounded by people that want to encourage you in it. And so I'd love to pray for anyone here that you don't know Jesus the way I'm talking about Him. And today, you would love to get to know Him, to start to discover that purpose that God has for your life, to start to receive that peace that He has for your life. So I'm just gonna count to three. And when I get to three, I want every person who's in the room, in the parents' lounge, in, the, in all who's or online, if you're saying, Thomas, when you pray for people, could you include me in this prayer? When I say three, just to lift your hand, High enough and long enough so I know who I'm praying with. You ready? One, don't let this moment slip by. Don't put it off to a moment you're not guaranteed you have. We have right here and right now. Two, I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Do you know Jesus? So when I say three, I want every person who wants to say yes for the first time or today you're coming back to Him. When I say three, just lift your hand. You ready? On three, three. Just lift your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over there and over there. You guys over there. Beautiful. Over here in the parents' lounge, online, in Aarhus as well. I can't see you from here. That's all good because God sees you. This is between you and Jesus. Beautiful. You can put your hands down. This is what we're going to do. We're going to say a prayer together. This is your first prayer. You're going to be praying a lot more in the days to come. This is your first one. And I'm just going to say just line for line, and I want to ask everyone just to repeat this after me. So let's close our eyes one more time. It doesn't make it more spiritual. It just removes distractions. Some of us need that. So just say this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. I'm sorry for my mistakes. I'm sorry for my mistakes. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. But today I choose you. Today I choose you. I make you my Lord and Savior. I make you my Lord and Savior. And from today, and from today I am forgiven. I'm, I'm, a I'm a follower of Jesus, and I am free. I am free. In, the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate every person making that decision? So good. So good. Man, we, we congratulate you because we know what this meant for us, and we know what it has the potential to mean for you. And I say potential. It's not that I don't believe in the prayer. It is just that when you say yes to Jesus and you make a prayer, what the Bible says is that you've changed your mind. You've repent. Repent just means to change your mind. You change your mind. You change your direction. That's awesome. It's like signing up to the gym. It's like great first step. But you've actually got to show up for it to make sense. And it's the same when you walk with Jesus. You have now changed direction. Now we've got to walk it out. And we want to encourage you in that. We want to help you in that. The first step is we want to give you a Bible. 
It's a gift from our church to you. It's just a New Testament Bible. Um, it has pictures in it. Um, but really, it's just a New Testament Christian Bible that we want to give you. And we want to just encourage you. It's just laid out like a you know, coffee table book, so it's easy to read. And I want to encourage you. We have Danish, English. I can see we've got Ukrainians. Uh, Bibles as well. Um, so on the way out, our team will be here in the parents' lounge in Aarhus as well. Just walk up to them. If you brought a friend, let them walk with you and just ask, can I have one of those free Bibles? And they're expecting you. So you're not a burden. Grab it and start to read it. And then the second thing I want to encourage you to do is keep coming back. I know that in, in Danish culture, sometimes I'll invite someone to church and they go, oh, Ben, oh, it's not like a once-off thing. <laughs> you know, like we, we go regularly. I mean, we go every week. Why? Because it's our flag in the sand. It's our, it's like, it's us like, it's us like just, you know, calibrating ourselves and go, you know, staying on the path, encouraging one another so we're ready for a new week. Amen. So come on, can we give all those people one more hand? <laughs> Celebrating them. Amazing. So good. Why don't we stand to our feet? Beautiful. Beautiful. So many people making decisions. That's amazing. Make sure, grab a Bible on the way out. And I'd love to pray with you. And uh, we're going to pray for everyone. But before we pray for everyone, I just want to pray for, um, as well, for you guys that are just going, man, I just got this, I've got this structure, natural thing in my life. I don't know. Maybe you're worried about it. Maybe you're not. But I just pray that our eyes will be open to the importance of this. Your marriage is spiritual. It might seem very natural because it is very natural. Lunches and, you know, do this and do that. And, you know, we have a little joke in our house of um, here comes dinner. You know, what are we doing for dinner tonight? And we have this ongoing joke. It's like, what are we doing for dinner tonight? And it's like every night. It's like, what are we doing? You know, it seems very natural. But the fact is, it's very spiritual because it's a natural structure that houses the supernatural. Amen. So we're going to pray for that, and we're going to pray even for you business people. You know, whatever it is that you, you're building in your life, don't just make it about the bottom line. You know, don't just make it about profit or loss. Add some purpose to it. You know, create a structure that's going to house the supernatural. Amen? So let me, we're going to pray for one another. We like to, at the end of the service, just to hold hands. So if you will, just uh, wipe your hand maybe just out of service to the person next to you. Grab the hand of a person. We're going to pray for one another. It's just a good picture and a reminder that we're not alone. So let me pray for you. Jesus, we just thank you for your people. Lord, I pray for your blessing over their lives. Lord, you know what they're about to face this week, Lord God, of natural things and natural structures and things that they're building and getting busy with, Lord God. And I just pray just for a peace in the midst of it all, Lord God. Lord, we just pray for your blessing over them. Protect them and guide them, Lord God. You open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. And Lord, we lift up our family and friends and people in our world who don't know you. Give us an opportunity this week to reach out an invitation for them to come and see for themselves that they too might have an encounter with you. We give you all the glory and all the praise for what you're doing in us and through us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And if you believe it, can you say amen? Amen. amen. Come on, can we thank Jesus for his word? Beautiful. Amazing. Well, God bless you, church. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. We really hope that that encouraged and blessed you. If you made a decision for Jesus, a massive congratulations from us. We would love to be in contact with you, send you a Bible and connect you to a local church. So just below in the details of this episode, there's a different way to contact us. So can I encourage you to reach out so that we can help you? Obviously, if you live anywhere near one of our physical locations, we really hope to see you in person very soon. There is nothing like being in the room. Can I also encourage you, if this blessed you, why don't you share this with friends and you know, make sure you pass it on to them as well. Make sure to click, click subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode we send out. God bless you.